take it to break this bugger out. The big one in the front. Scriptures from John 20, uh, verses 19 through 31. I've got to get in the New Testament first. Hold on, guys. 19 through 31. Here we go. <laughs> it's big print, too. I don't need these. <laughs> okay, John 20, verses 19. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The Lord's disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the marks of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails I, and hands on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered, My Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, You have believed because you have seen. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe and Jesus, that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing, you may have life in his name. It's the Sunday after Easter for us, but that's not the way it is in the scripture. This scripture is referring to the night that the women went to the empty tomb. So we're in on the joke that we're celebrating this Holy Humor Sunday. God has done something so ex unexpected, so mind-boggling, that you really just have to laugh. Tracy, can we have the next slide there? You really just have to laugh if you aren't going to cry from the shock and beauty of it all. We're gonna recap what we know from last week with a song. So we're gonna have some slides come up, and this is to the tune of Hark the Herald Angels Sing. to this one in just a minute. <laughs> so you might have noticed our call to worship was a little bit different this morning. We had lots of funny noises going on, cymbals clanging, but those are really the words of the psalm. We are invited to praise God for all kinds of joy this morning. So it says praise God in the sanctuary, and that's what we're doing. Praise God for mighty deeds with all kinds of music and joy and laughter because we know what the disciples aren't yet so sure of, that Christ is not dead, but alive. 
and has removed the twin threats of sin and death from our lives. Now, we might still be subject to these problems, but they don't have a hold on us now. They don't have the last word in our lives because God, through Christ, has the last word and the last laugh. We can't be kept down by either one. Now, that's a matter of faith. You have to come to believe this. Thomas had to see it and feel it and touch it. We're supposed to just accept this, that Christ has freed us from sin and death. But I know some of you are probably like Thomas. You need to touch things. You need to feel things. And, and so I want you to know your pastor is prepared to take care of you. If you have trouble believing by faith that your sins are forgiven, you may come to my office. I have a, a supply kit here. This is the Wash Away Your Sins sampler pack. Um, Wash Away Your Sins lip balm is handy salvation for a sinner on the go. <laughs> then uh, we have toy toy towelettes. If, if you really are in a hurry, we have the Wash Away Your Sins towelettes. They are heavenly scented and kill sin on contact. Next we have, for those who really need to get themselves clean, the Wash Away Your Sins Cleansing Bar. It's easy to use and it reduces guilt by 98.9%. Here's what you do. You unwrap the soap, you engage your water supply, you moisten yourself, lather vigorously, rinse and repent. And this is the industrial strength. Some of you maybe don't need industrial strength, though you like something a little gentler. So this is the baptism in a bottle bubble bath. It removes stubborn guilt, and uh, the easy way it does it is to, there's no rinsing, no scrubbing, no harsh fumes, and no visible sin scum. And the way you do this is you kneel before thy tub, reflect upon wrongdoing, run a warm bath, Pour in enough bubble bath to equal your sins, which is probably double the amount you think you need. Submerge thyself in blessed bubbles. Soak, arise cleansed from sin and ready to go. But finally, if that is not enough for some of you, I have the hellfire and damnation right here in a bottle. So if you have trouble like Thomas, I'd rather you just come to believe. That is what we are supposed to do. But if you have trouble, you can come to my office and I will help you. Well, normally we are not so vigorous in our praise. Our culture makes us think church sometimes has to be somber. We're, we're kind of quiet in here a lot of times. So the words of the psalm encourage us to make noise, to make a scene, to make merry, in fact, because God is amazing and wonderful, and we know that Christ is alive, and we have all the reason in the world to set aside our normally careful ways of worshiping and celebrate wildly. Yes. <laughs> But the disciples don't know that yet. It's all brand new to them, and they are locked away in a room on the day of the resurrection. They know the tomb is empty. The women came and told them that, but they can't wrap their heads around the reason why. And it's likely that they were riddled with guilt. They needed some of this stuff because Jesus told them he was going to be persecuted and killed and they didn't believe him, and they weren't ready for it, and they didn't do anything to protect him, and now it's happened, and they feel just terrible. And it's likely that they're afraid they'll be next. You know, the powers that be wanted to stop this movement, and they have been publicly traveling with Jesus. So it stands to reason that there is some fear on their part that they might be next. Fear and doubt have not yet been replaced by hope, faith, and joy in their lives. But then Jesus comes among them. Now we have to ask, how did he get in? The door is locked. It says that. And suddenly he's just there with them. So can't you see him outside the door going, knock, knock, and, and, and you folks are just like the disciples because some of them probably said nothing at all because they didn't want anyone to know if someone's knocking at that door. They don't want anyone to know that we're in here. 
But some of them might have said, who's there? Because you're not going to open that door for just anybody. But can you imagine if Jesus had said, knock, knock, and they said, who's there? And then he said, Jesus, and you would say, I bet they would say Jesus who because they do not believe he is going to show up in that room on this day. They have been told on the third day he would rise, but they don't have a clue what's going on. We don't have a clear answer of how he got into that room either. The Bible is not real clear on that, but there he stands. He offers them peace. He shows them his hands and his side, as if to say, I am who you think I am. I am the one who was crucified. And then they rejoice. And of course they would. Can you imagine the chaos in a room if a bunch of people are gathered after what they think is a memorial service and the person who they love, who they thought had died, walks into the room? There would be laughing and crying and lots of energy, I imagine. And just this morning as I was driving here, I was listening to NPR. I guess there's a new movie coming out about some men who climbed Mount Everest. And there's one man named Beck Weathers who actually had this happen to him. He got separated from the group. He got caught in a blizzard. He was freezing to death. He was lying face down in the snow. Some of the others came and saw him, but he was so near to death that they thought there was no way they could help him. And they left him there. And apparently he laid there for a day and a half, and you're not supposed to recover from something like this, but somehow he got up and found his way back to uh, where they were. And one of the other climbers was a doctor, and you know what Beck Weathers allegedly said? I hope you take my medical insurance. <laughs> Humor works in the most amazing and critical times. So Jesus offers them peace, and then he offers them some hard work. He says, as the Father has sent me, so I send you, and he breathed on them. Now, you know, commentaries have all different kinds of things. There's no way in one sermon you can put in everything that you read. And here's one I would normally leave out. One commentator wondered what his breath would have smelled like. I do not wonder that. He'd been in a tomb three days. But there is something about this breath that is important because the word for breath is the same word for spirit. He breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Well, thank God he gave them the Holy Spirit first because how many of us would want the job of deciding whose sins are going to keep and whose we are going to forgive? That is a giant task. And especially when we think about the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, where we ask for forgiveness for others as we forgive them. I mean, as we ask for forgiveness for us as we forgive the others. This is a huge thing that he's given them, risky business. But Thomas wasn't there. He missed the whole thing. Now, you remember last week, I was a little grumpy about Luke's gospel here because Luke says that the women came and said that the angels told them that Jesus was not in the tomb because he was risen, and the men thought it was an idle tale. And there we have the picture. Oh, no, 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 no. Well, now these men get a taste of their own medicine because they tell Thomas they've actually seen the Lord. And he says, uh-uh, unless I see the marks myself, no, I am not going to believe. So a week later, Thomas gets his chance. They're all gathered in the house again. This time Thomas is there. The doors are shut again. And once again, Jesus finds his way in. He offers peace, and then he invites Thomas to do something that none of the others seem to need to do. He says, go ahead and touch it. Feel it. So Thomas 
finally, at this point, declares the praise we've been waiting for. He says, my Lord and my God. Here is the moment of recognition. He knows he is in the presence of the risen Christ. He's astounded, but he believes. So, you know, we hear this story every year. And so we're kind of like people who have seen the movie before. Have you ever done that where you're sitting with a group of people who haven't seen the movie, but you have? And you know something hysterically funny is about to happen, but it looks tense right now. And you start laughing and people wonder, what is the matter with you? This doesn't look funny at all. A glorious moment is coming just when everything seemed to have gone wrong. Charles Reeb says, as trouble befalls our world, Christians can go about our business with a grin because we know who has the last word. This grin will make the discouraged curious. People always want to know what's behind a grin. And so it is. God has given us a story that makes us grin from ear to ear, that makes us want to laugh and shout out loud. Christ has been raised from the dead. He's forgiven our sins, and we are invited into a life of joy and peace. And we need to remember that when things get dark sometimes. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise God with clanging cymbals. Psalms invites us to do it. Let everything that breathes, not just humans, but everything that breathes, in fact, let all creation praise the Lord. So we're going to do that now by singing together a hymn of praise called Sing a Happy Alleluia. And if you know the tune, Come Ye Sinners Poor and Needy, um, you will recognize this tune. your turn. We know that some of you have brought jokes. 
Kathy has put jokes in our slideshow, so we've got some funny ones that'll be coming on the screen, but the ushers have one mic and I have the other. So we'll come to you. Who brought jokes to share? This is a dual part joke. Who's the greatest male financier in the Bible? Noah, because he stayed afloat when everyone else liquidated. And these are, these are aimed for the finance committee too. So <clears throat> now who's the greatest female financier in the Bible? It was Pharaoh's daughter. She went to the river and pulled out a prophet. Anybody? Knock, knock. Who's there? Lemmy. Lemmy. Lemmy, and I'm starving. <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? Cow. Cow. No, cows go moo. <laughs> That's a good one. Mine's long, so I need to be in the front. <clears throat> okay, there was this motorcycle dude, big burly guy, black leather, whole bit, but he had a good heart. He helped old ladies carry their groceries from the grocery store. He got the cats out of the trees. He was a good person, and God noticed this. So he said, we'll call him Paul. Paul, you have led a good life. And I would like to do a favor for you. What would you like? And he thought about it, and he said, man. He says, you know, me and my riding buddies, we always wanted to drive to Hawaii. Could you build a bridge to Hawaii? And the Lord went, hmm. He said, do you know how far that is? How much concrete and rebar it would take? What's your second wish? And Paul went, could you explain women to me? And the Lord went, do you want two lane or four lane on that bridge? <laughs> so one day, an atheist decides to go for a hike. He's out enjoying the trees and admiring all the beauty that evolution has brought. Just admiring everything. And all of a sudden, he hears these lumbering footsteps behind him, this really heavy, haggard breath. So he turns around, and there's a gigantic bear, and it's running after him. So he's running as fast as he can away from the bear. The bear's picking up speed, catching up with him. And eventually, he trips, and he falls down on the ground, and the bear's right on top of him, and he shouts out, Oh, my God! And all of a sudden, time freezes. The bear freezes, the birds in the trees freeze, even the water in the creek stops flowing, and this heavenly light opens up down upon the man, and this voice comes out and says, you've spent your whole life denying my existence. You've spent your whole life teaching others to not believe in me. Why should I believe that you're a believer now? And the atheist takes some time to think about it, and he says, you know what, God? I will reconsider my beliefs if you help me out and you make that bear a good Christian bear. God says, so be it. So the light goes away, everything restarts, and instead of pouncing down upon the man, the bear gets down on its knees, folds its paws and says, for this meal I am about to eat, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, I thank you greatly. <laughs> I can do this one. Sister Mary Elizabeth and Sister Mary Genevieve are out writing about their community in their old VW van, and they're doing their parish nurse program when they run out of gas. So they sputter over to the side of the road, and Sister Mary Elizabeth says, well, Sister Mary Genevieve, what are we going to do? So Ms. Sister Mary Genevieve says, well, we passed the gas station a little way back there. We certainly can walk back there, get some gas, bring it here and we'll be fine. They look around the van, the van, but they don't have any, they don't have a gas can. So Sister Mary Elizabeth says, well, we can certainly buy a gas can. 
Well, Sister Mary Genevieve is the treasurer, so she says, no, 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 we, we need to find something else because the gas can will cost more than the gas. So they search through the van, and they find a bedpan. <laughs> so they pick up the bedpan, and they head back to the gas station. They get to the gas station, very carefully fill the bedpan, and they're walking back to the, the van. Just about the time they get to the van, the Methodist women's group comes out of the house across the street. And they're talking and saying goodbye to each other. And, and all of a sudden, they noticed these two nuns walking along the road carrying the bedpan. They get to the van, open the gas container, gas cap. They pour the gasoline into the van. The Methodist women across the street look at all of this, and the leader says, if that van starts, I'm converting. <laughs> A couple weeks ago, in this very place, an esteemed member of our choir accosted me and said, you look just like her. What's the guy's name? Bernie. Bernie. I said, oh my gosh, and I've had a terrible two weeks since then. Today, they sang All in the Family. That helped. Uh, but in the meantime, just to erase some of that image, I went and got a haircut. <laughs> Today, I wore my vest that looks like I might be a member of the NRA. <laughs> but I've been wondering all week, whether that fellow was looking for a debate, like uh, maybe with, and with Ernie, or, or Bernie, and so he, to, to fit that bill, he would have had to either had long, blonde, yellow hair of some sort, been referred to as Mrs. Ambassador, or been a proponent of, of carpet bombing or some dumb thing. Anyway, uh, I've, I've come to forgive him for that. And the service this morning has been wonderful. But I would enjoin him, and David, you might want to see uh, Pastor Diane. She has some remedies for people that she says are available for anybody that needs to cleanse themselves. <laughs> Thank you, David, for the input. It's given me a lot of thought. What's my line? Oh. Why did the Buddhist tell the dentist not to give him any Novocaine when he filled his tooth? He was trying to transcend dental medication. So what do you get, what do you, you should know the answer to this question, but Kay knows. What, what, what do you get when you drop a piano down a mine shaft? A flat minor. A flat minor, that is. <laughs> so uh, we're gonna, let's reverse these. How many altos does it take, how many altos does it take to change a light bulb? None. They can't get up that high. <laughs> <laughs> what is an, an agnostic, dyslexic, insomniac? Someone who lays awake at night wondering if there's a dog. <laughs> okay. Just have one, one last one. How many choir directors does it take to screw in a light bulb? <laughs> she got it. And God promised men that there would be good and obedient wives in all corners of the earth. He made the earth round and laughed and laughed and laughed. Uh, a fellow went in to see a psychiatrist and said, Doc, I just haven't been able to sleep and wink. I, I stay awake thinking of the craziest things. Uh, what's, what's happening? Uh, a couple of nights ago, I thought I was in an Indian teepee. 
and, and last night I thought I was in a, in a wigwam. What, 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 what is happening? The doc looked at him and said, ah, two tents. Anybody else? I'm going to try to get this right, because Steve does a joke, but he won't stand up. Okay, so there was a funeral procession, and there was a coffin in the back of the hearse, and, it, and the hearse went up the hill, and the door opened in the back, and the, curse, the, her, the coffin started sliding down the hill, down the hill, down the hill, bumped over the curb, went into the pharmacy door, came up to the counter, the body popped up, and the pharmacist said, oh, he says, hey, got something for this coffin? <laughs> okay, so uh, a dog walks into a bar with his, his front left paw bandaged, and he puts it up on the bar, and he said, I came here to see who shot my paw. <laughs> Anybody? Anybody? I can't tell the others. I don't ever remember the punchlines. That was the short joke. It was easier for me. Oh, one more. Patty, you waited till I got all the way back there. Yeah. It's a robosize. Okay. So there was a sign in front of the church. We are in need of a painter to paint our church. So a gentleman applied for the job. He got all of his equipment together. He went to the church. He started painting. And it was starting to look really good. He was almost done until he got to the steeple. And he didn't have enough paint. So he thought, what can I do? I don't have the money to go get more paint. So maybe if I just thin it down with water, it'll, it'll cover it. And so he got up, or he put water in the paint and mixed it up. And he got up there. And he painted the steeple, and it looked great. The sun was shining, it dried, and he was really proud of his job. And then all of a sudden, the clouds came, the lightning came, the thunder came, and it rained. And all of that paint washed right off the church. And the moral of this story is, repaint and thin no more. I think we've exhausted the drinks. Right. Knock, knock. Philip. Philip, these offering baskets as they come around, would you please? <laughs> 